Our Father and our God in heaven, we want to thank you so much for such praises. We want to thank you so much for once again another opportunity that you granted us to come before you your presence. The praise we to watch you and to study your word. We want to thank you so much for all the providence that you blessed us since the time you came in this place. Let the physical and the spiritual. It is a humble prayer that on heaven that you know your master and your love to rest upon each one of us as we enter into another session of the day. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins. It is a humble prayer that may you draw each one of us closer to you in true repentance and confession. But our sins may be forgiven and be put about of Jesus Christ, transferred into the heavenly sanctuary that they may be able to die from the right time. It's that time. It's my humble prayer that as we go into the study, we may prepare our hearts. You may help us put away all filthiness, all pride, envy, and mice, and all that which can be, can prevent your work from being sown in our hearts. And you pray that may you give us kindness and meekness, that you may really accept your work with gladness. I want to thank you so much for the previous study that I've done so far. We pray that may also be with us in this one. May you bless us with uh, the Holy Spirit. And we know the heavenly angels begin to displace the world. Once again, press to come back upon our minds for so the comprehend of that which one has comprehend from the stones. We want to thank you so much for all the sisters and the brothers that have been able to reach this place. And we want to know that for us as we are traveling and just running. To be very blessed, become of them for the most transport and all the means they need in order to come and be the same to the brother. Your word. Thank you so much for the sick people for your healing. We want to pray and may your will continue to be done in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, come to you. Amen. So good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. I'll greet you until everyone will respond. Good morning, everyone. The Lord is good. Good time. So we thank the Lord for once again another opportunity that has, he has granted us to be in this place to study his work. It seems like some people are not with us here. Are they cooking? So I don't know. It's my humble prayer that the Lord may drive them and bring them here very fast so that we will preserve them. So yesterday, we looked at the nature of the last gospel that is to be given to the world and its purpose. We looked at the surface of this everlasting gospel and we all saw that this gospel runs in how many steps? runs in three steps. And we said we can clearly see this by just going to the book of Revelation 14. Again, we have how many messages? We have three messages. So we say those three messages are to be given in their order. In their order. Each message has a purpose. It has time. And each message has a place where it accomplishes its, pur its purpose. So we said we must receive them in their, in their order. 
the first angel must come do its work. Second comes do its work. And then the third, we're going to say that is the message that accomplishes God's purpose in our life, in our lives. So we went and looked at the general purpose of the everlasting gospel. We looked at the general what? General purpose of the everlasting, the everlasting gospel. So can we remind ourselves what was the purpose or what is the purpose of the everlasting gospel? Let me begin with this young man, yes? So its purpose is to remove sin from us, yes? The purpose of the gospel we looked at yesterday's presentation it is to clean and mm -hmm. pray in Okay. Thank you, thank you. So, first of all, we should know that the man is an error, an error, unrighteous. How do you get Yes. So, he's a transgressor. So, we say the pattern of the gospel is to make him, make him righteous. To make him righteous. Then we say the same man is condemned. Is there an idea? No. It's condemned. Condemned to what? To death. And what's the purpose of the gospel? To death. So the burden of the gospel is to justify a sin. Justify. The fire. And what is the burden of the gospel to this evil heart? To uproot it and provide a sin and the new heart. A new heart. So it will be provided with a new heart. A new heart. But we say we never talk about the heart. In most cases, we are talking about a man. Mind. Okay? And you said because of this new, because of this evil heart, in a man there is no what? There is no enemy. And then you have what? Sin. For sin. So what's the burden of the gospel? So the burden of the gospel is to plan or to put in it. That's not good. Is to put in there, okay, for sin in man. We say this evil heart defiled the entire what? The entire human being. So man is defiling. If I and I'm not is it a big issue? Defined by what? By sin and what is the purpose of the gospel? To make him cleanser. So the purpose or the value of the gospel is to clean to cleanse man from all from all sin. All together. Then it is another problem. This man has a record on him. He has a record, a record that he is a sinner, he is a transgre transgressor. So there is a record of sin indeed, wherever he was. He is known very well. So what's the burden of the gospel? To blot it out. So there is blotting out of this sin. So this is the problem 
that the gospel is going to address. And this is the, solo, the solution. So that is what we specifically saw yesterday. Simple as it is. The only challenge that we have, we all, we've always been going through the things and is somehow now they are boiling. When we talk about issues of sin, people begin to sleep because they have talked about to sin from their childhood, from their childhood. And they feel like as if they know more about sin and they should not learn about what? About sin. Yet it is the real problem that the gospel is addressing. So we say the gospel in its fifth step, steps is to solve all these problems. The gospel in its fifth steps, it must make man righteous. In its three steps, the gospel must justify what? Justify a sinner. The gospel is to let the man go free from condemnation. The gospel in its three steps, it should create a new heart, a new heart in man. The gospel in its three steps, it must plant a name in the sin in man. The gospel in its three steps, it must cleanse man from all what? From all sin. And the gospel in its three steps, must work out sin, sin from man. So that is what we specifically saw yesterday, yes? Four. Number four. So there is a one, two, three, four. So number four. So we read the quotation, huh? and we are told when a man transgressed, transgressed, his entire being was corrupt, corrupted, and he became a friend to the first transgress, transgressor. So there was no enemy between him and Satan, and Satan, and because they are friends, and is always there to do the will of Satan. So in simple terms, we are saying there is no in him any enemy, enemy for, for doing the sin. Sin is always there, willing to do sin. He yearns to do sin. It's not coming. You've got it. Okay. So in him, there is love to sin. I always say, for a sinner, if something good is put here and something bad is put in Kampala, a sinner will leave something good here and will go away to Kampala to do evil. No. Why? There is no any love for him to do good. What is inside him, he loves to do wrong. So the gospel must solve that problem and put him back. The gospel is to take selfishness out of him and then plant love in him as it was at the beginning. The beginning. So I want you always to remember that. Keep that at the back of your minds. So in today's study, we are going to look at the nature of the first gospel mm -hmm. and the hand of faith. So we need to ask ourselves the question, why do we need to go and look at the first gospel? While we are looking at the last gospel to be given to the world. Remember our burden is to give the last gospel, which is brought to view in the book of Revelation 14. 14. But there is need for us to go back and first study the first go, the first gospel. Why? If we go to the book of Isaiah, these are some of the laws that we are supposed to cover and we do not get time. So I said I'll always be bringing them on board. So when you go to Isaiah 46, 
verse 8 to 10, the Bible says, remember the former things of what? Remember the former things of all. And the Bible is giving you a reason as to why you need to remember these former things of all. It says, because God is God and none is like you, like him. He declares the end from where? The beginning. He declares the end from the beginning. So we always have a beginning and you have a what? The end. The end. So we have the first gospel and we have the last what? So at the beginning, what are we having? The first gospel. And what are we having at the end? We are having the last what? The last gospel. So if God declares the end from where? From the beginning. It implies that God is going to use the first gospel to let us understand fully what is going to be the last word. Gospel. Are we all together? Yes. So God uses the past to let us understand the last. Yes. The last. But he uses this prophetic tone everywhere. He says, I'm the, I'm the Alpha and the what? And the Omega. I am the beginning and I'm the ending. So because that is what he is, he also uses the beginning to tell us the eh, the end. He uses the first gospel to let us understand the last word, the last gospel. For you to clearly understand the nature of the last gospel, you must go and study clearly the nature of the first word, gospel. For you to come and understand what's really the purpose of the last gospel, you're going to grasp it well if you go and look at the purpose of the first go of the first gospel. If you go to Revelation 14, you may not clearly understand what is really the purpose of that gospel. If you're just a surface reader, you just go and read the fear of God and give him glory. Babylon is foreign. Babylon is foreign. You read about the beast, the mark and it's it. The beast its image and its mark. If you're a surface reader, you cannot really understand what is the burden of the three angels' messages. But if you're to fully understand the burden of these three messages, what you need is to go and study the first go, the first gospel, because it's going to uncover what really is the burden of the three angels' messages. The experience that God's people went through after receiving the first gospel is going to tell us the experience we are going to go through after we receive the three angels' messages when we come to the end of the world. The way they received these messages is going to be the way we are going to be receiving these messages when we come to the end of the what? The end of the world. Mm -hmm. So God uses the first to let us understand the last. The last. So what is the first gospel? So the first gospel, we all know, it's brought to view in Genesis 3.15. All our presenters have been mentioning this since the time we came here. So I want us to study Genesis 3.15 with a sober mind. And once we know the burden of that gospel is going to be the burden of the three angels' messages at the end of the what? At the end of the world. So it says, and I will put an enemy. Who is speaking here? God is speaking to who? Adam and Eva. And the serpent. Okay. So I will put an enemy between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her what? And her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his what? His heel. Don't forget, we're looking at the nature of the first word. The nature of the first gospel. So by mere reading, you can see the burden of this gospel and its nature. So first of all, here God is not saying, I've put an enmity. 
Is it what he's saying? He says, I will what? I will. So what is God doing here? God is promising. And what is he promising? To plant what? Enemite between what? Between, between the serpent and the what? Hey, I'm going to be forcing you to rest to, to speak because we've just eaten people in sleep. So I'm going to be calling you. I'll speak a word. I will not end it and I'll require you to complete it. So the first gospel is a promise. God is promising man. And what is he promising? That he's going to plant an enmity between him and the serpent and the seed of the serpents. So implying there was no what? Enemity. There was no enmity. And God was promising to plant an enmity between the woman, the serpent, and between the seeds of the woman and the seeds of the what? In the seeds of the serpent. So the burden of the three angels' messages, what is its burden? It's, it's burden is what? Its burden is to plant an enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between the seed of the woman and the seed of the what? And between the seeds of the serpent. And they're telling us the means that God is going to use to accomplish this promise. So he says, I will put an enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and her seed, it shall bruise thy what? Thy head. So what's going to bruise the head? An image. So the seed of the what? I want you to listen very well. I will put an enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy what? Thy seed and her what? So these are the seeds of the what? Of the sa, of the serpent, and then the seed of the what? Of the woman. So he goes ahead and says, "It shall bruise thy what? It shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his what?" Is here. So this promise was to be accomplished through the seed of the what? The woman. The promise was going to be accomplished through. So what was going to bruise the head of the serpent? Pardon? No. The enmity. Let us read it carefully. We said when we come to reading this, the everlasting gospel, we need to read it with a lot of what? Okay, yeah. So he says, and I will put, I will put an eh between, between the and the, and the woman. There is a comma. And between what? They said, and how what? So first of all, he's going to plant a name between the who? The woman and what? And the serpent. And then between what? Between the seed of the what? Between the seed of the woman and the seed of the what? Of the serpent. Can we see that? Sure. Then he goes ahead and says, eat. What is the eat there? The seed. The seed, all together. So the seed shall bruise thy what? Which, which head? Who's he? Who's he? Who's he? The serpent is what? So the seed of the woman was going to bruise the head of the what? Of the serpent. And the serpent was going to bruise the what? The head of the seed of the what? So God was speaking to who and who here? Is God speaking to here specifically? He's speaking to someone. So he's speaking to the what? The to the serpent. Can you read it again? Read it again. 
I will put a name, a name between V and the what? So who is the V? The serpent out together. So I will put a name between you and the woman. When you come to this chapter, this verse, there is some prophecy. No, no, no. Let us continue. <laughs> so, and I will put an enemy a between thee and the, and the woman. So he's speaking to thee, and the thee we are saying is the, the serpent. Comma, and between thy seed and her what? And her seed. He's still speaking to the same what? Serpent. Same individual, the serpent. But he's saying he's going to put an enemy between the seed of the sap, the serpent, and the seed of the what? The seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. Comma. It shall bruise thy head. So the seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the what? Of the serpent, and thou shall bruise his head. And the serpent is going to bruise the heel of the seed of the what? Of the woman. So here God is speaking to the serpent. Yes. Why are they using heels? No. The heels is the seed of the woman, not the woman. So do we see the seed of the of the serpent having a lot to do there? Yes. Yeah. The seed bruises the heel. So it shall what? Bruise the heel. Bruise thy yeah. thy head. So the seed of the woman here is bruising the head of the serpent. And thou. Yeah. Thou, who's the thou? Serpent. Shall bruise his heel. So here we don't specifically see the work of the seed of the what? Of the serpent. No, it's there. It is there. The bruising of the heel, that is the work. All who's, the who's bruising the heel? Of the seed of the woman. The seed of the serpent. Let us read it very well. The problem is English. Eh? It's not yeah. our mother tongue. Eh? It. So what is the it? It, it shall bruise thy head. And who is thy? Satan. Satan. All together. Comma. And thou. That is the serpent. Shall bruise. His. Who is the heel? And thou shalt bruise his heel. Yeah. 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 So we can also see the role of the seed of the sun, of the serpent. So in most cases, we read these verses very fast. So if you look at specifically that gospel, we shall go back and internalize it very well. But what I want us to see here, first of all, this gospel, God is pro promising. And he's showing us the means that he's going to use to accomplish to accomplish this purpose. Can you all see that? Let us go to Spirit of Prophecy and see. So Bible commentary, BC 900, started 2.3. Yes, Seven BC, nine, today 2.3. So he says the promise, the what? The promise given to Adam and to Eva in the Eden was the gospel to the foreign what? 
to the foreign race. So it was a promise, and at the same time, it was what? It was a, go a gospel. So what we are seeing here, the gospel was in the form of a what? Promise. Was in form of a promise. So he goes ahead and says, the promise was made that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent is what? The serpent is head, and it shall bruise his head. He goes ahead and says, Christ's sacrifice is the glorious fulfillment of the whole Jewish what? Jewish economy. The sun of righteousness has risen. Christ, our righteousness, is shining in the brightness upon what? Upon us. So the first gospel was a promise which was to be fulfilled through hope. Christ. Which was to be fulfilled through Christ. So I want you to mark this too. It was a promise which was to be fulfilled in the future. In the future. Uh, 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 just, I hope you make it clear because uh, it is not the humanity that are going to, to bruise the head of the serpent. Yeah. But Christ. Christ. And so, so humanity has to give Christ their sin so that he may bruise Satan. Because it's not seeds, yeah. but seed. Yeah. Thank you. A war between Christ and Satan. and Satan. Okay. So can we all see that? So specifically, the first gospel is a pro promise. A promise which was to be established or fulfilled at a certain point in time. Point in time. Mm -hmm. So what I want you to say, the gospel came to these people in the form of a what? Promise. In the form of a promise. And they had to wait for the fulfillment of this what? Promise. For the fulfillment of this promise. Mm -hmm. So what I want to let you know is that when we also come to our time, the gospel somehow is going to come to us in form of a promise, which is to be fulfilled at a certain point in what? In time. in time. So if we can go back and study spiritual prophecy very well, it's going to tell us that Adam and Eve waited for the seed of the what? Of the woman. They gave birth to their first son and they thought this was the seed of the what? The seed of the woman. Who was the firstborn? Kain. Kain. But it was not the seed of the woman. They gave birth to the second born. They thought it was it the seed of the woman. Unfortunately, they saw the brother killing, brother killing the brother. So these people waited, waited, and they died without seeing the seed of the what? The seed of the woman. But they died in the faith of receiving the, the seed of the what? The seed of the woman to come and fulfill the pro the promise. Fulfill the promise. So there are not many ways to heaven. Each one may not choose his own way. Christ says, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father, but by what? But by me. He says, since the first gospel was preached, when in Eden it was declared that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head, Christ had been uplifted as the way, the truth, and the what? And the life. So God here is promising, but whatever he has promised was, fulfilled. was to be fulfilled through the seed of the woman who is Christ. Christ. Who is Christ. So when we come to the end of the world, the gospel comes to us in the same way. God is promising to give us eternal what? And he's saying this eternal life is in God, is in Christ. And what we need to do is to believe and wait for that point when we are going to receive that what? Receive that internal life. So 1 John 5, 11 to 13, he says, and this is the record that God has given us what? Given us internal life and this life is in hope, is in his son. So from the beginning, 
God has been promising, but whatever he has promised is in his what? Is in his son. And there is a time when he comes into history and fulfills this what? Fulfills this, pro this promise. So we are going to see that this first gospel is magnified in other chapters of the Bible. So I want us to go through these promises in different Bible verses. And we see that at the end of the day, God expands Genesis 3, 15 to the extent that everything whether is here is captured. Capture. Is captured. So when we go to Ezekiel 36, verse 24 to 28, this is what he says. He says, for I will take I will take you from among the heaven and gather you out of the countries and I will bring you into your own land. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water upon, upon you and ye shall be clean from all your what? From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. He says, a new what? A new heart also will I what? Will I give you. And he says, a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take away a stony heart out of your flesh. What is that stony heart? According to what we, we've discussed. Sinful heart. The sinful heart. The evil heart. The evil heart. The carnal mind. So he says, I'll, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of what? A heart flesh. of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my what? In my statues. And ye shall keep mm -hmm. my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I, I give. I gave to your father, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your what? And I will be your God. Still, God here is promising. Always the gospel comes to man in form of a promise. God is promising, and he has a time when he's going to come and fulfill his what? Fulfill his promise. At the end of the world, the gospel still comes to us in a form of a promise. And God has a specific time when he's going to come and fulfill that what? And fulfill that promise as we're going to see. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Still, God is magnifying Genesis 3, 15. He says, behold, the day come, says the Lord, and I'll make a new what? A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of what? With the house of Judah. He says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, says the, the Lord. Lord. He says, but this is but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of what? I want you to listen. Israel. He says, but this is, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of what? Israel after those what? After those days. So after, after certain days, God is going to come and is going to make a what? Is going to make a covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He says, I will put my law in their what? In their inward parts. And I'll write it in their hearts. So it's going to put it in our inward parts and is going to write it again in their hearts. He says, and, and I'll be their God, 
and they shall be my what? They shall be my people. Verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. My brothers and sisters, once the Lord has made this covenant, there is no more standing here and we make such a noise that we are making today. When that time comes and God makes his covenant, we shall have no more preaching. We are going to make a lot of noise here with the issues of the sanctuary. Once this covenant is established, you will never see me anymore preaching about the sanctuary. My brother, Eric, is teaching us about the one true art. Once this covenant is established, we shall have no more. Brother Eric is standing and laboring to teach people to know that there is one true God. So he says, they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, you know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them. Says the Lord. Even the baby is going to know the Lord. He says from the least to the greatest, everyone is going to know the Lord. It's like today. <laughs> the entire world did not see from the least to the what? You don't need to teach a baby see. You don't need to teach him how to envy. Just get one baby, get your baby, put him aside. Get another baby, put him on your laps. What's going to happen? Jealous. You will see them cry. And if there is an opportunity to fight, you will see them fighting. You don't need to teach them. So God is promising us that once he comes and makes his covenant, we are all going to know him from the least to the greatest. My brothers, there is a time when God is going to come and establish his covenant. There is time when he's going to come and write his laws in our inward parts. There is time he's going to come and write his laws on our hearts. And once this is accomplished, and I believe he's not writing his law on this silver heart. Why is he writing them? Writing them on the new heart. Once we've received a new heart, and once this covenant is established, no more sinning, no more calling. He says, for says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no Amen. more. So in simple terms, he's going to forgive our sins and he's going to blot out our transgressions. Our sin, never to remember them anymore. My brothers and sisters, there is time, there is a day when God is going to come and forgive our sins and brought them out never and never to remember them anymore. If God can forget our sins, what about we ourselves? So I believe if God will forget completely our sins, we shall also forget our sins. Never to remember them anymore. So that is Jeremiah. 31, 31 is also telling us after those days he's going to come and establish his convent. Convenience. He's going to come and make his covenant with his people. Malachi 3, 114. One, two, four. Malachi 3, 1 to 4. Still God is expanding Genesis 315. He says, Behold, I'll send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. So there is time when the Lord that you always seek for 
is going to suddenly come to his work, to his temple. And when he comes into his temple, what shall he do? The Bible says, Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, says the Lord of what? The Lord of hosts. Verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a what? A refiner's fire. And like a what? A fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of what? Maybe. The sons of lead and it shall purge them as gold and what? Silver and they may, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in what? In righteousness. My brothers and sisters, there is a day that we are going to offer an offer before the Lord in righteousness. There is a day when we are going to sing and our Father in heaven will say, yes, yes, yes. And that is when the messenger of the covenant has accomplished his work in his word. Has accomplished his work in his word. Has accomplished his work in his word. Don't fear. In his temple, in his sanctuary. So he says, but who may abide the day of his what? Of his coming. And who shall stand when he appeareth? So there is a day when he comes to make his covenant. There is a day when he appears. But when he appears, he appears as the refiner of as the refiner's what? Fire and he, he appears like a fuller's what? The fuller's soap. He sits as the refiner and a purifier of who? Of silver. How is silver purified? Seven times. In what? In a furnace. So there is a day when the Lord comes <laughs> into his temple. I want to believe which temple is brought to view here. Which temple? The two temples. Pardon? Like actually, we can see the two ways the temple, which is our body, and then the heavenly temple mm -hmm. that is in the session of Christ. Thank you so much. The two temples. So there is the day when he comes into his what? His temple. We are going to see there is a day when he comes into his most holy place, and there is a day when he comes into our physical temples and cleanses them as silver and gold seven times more in fire. Until it throw fire and spiritual what? Spiritual fires we shall see. So there is a day when he comes, that is the same day when he comes and makes his co okay. covenant. But when he comes, mm -hmm. he comes as a, as a refiner, he comes as a pure a purifier of silver, and he, he shall purify the sons of Lev. Who are the sons of Lev? Priests. The priests. And who are the priests today? Ah. When you go to Exodus 19, he says, if you keep my what? My commandments and my judgments. I'll make you a kingdom of what? Priesthood. A kingdom of priesthood. So when he comes in his temple, what happens? He cleanses us. He purifies us as silver. He purifies us as gold, as gold to the extent that now we stand without a mediator and we offer an offering before the Lord in what? In, right, yes, in righteousness. He says, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be present unto the Lord as in the days of old, 
and mm -hmm. as in the former what? Former years. As in the former days. My brothers and sisters, Adam and Eva, every day they walked and their only hope was in the coming of who? The seed of the of woman. Of the seed of the woman. Or they are talk. We can say while well, they are digging in the Garden of Eden. All their meditation was on that day when the seed of the woman was going to come in place and establish the covenant and establish the promise. It is supposed to be our experience. We are to walk a journey of faith. We are to hold our faith onto the end. We are to walk waiting for that day when the Lord is going to come suddenly in his temple and establish all his promises in our lives. So we want to see the experience of these people before the coming of the Messiah. Remember we are saying there is a point when the Lord comes and establishes his what? His promises. The day the gospel comes to us is not the day when the promises are what? Are established. But there is a point when these promises are going to be what? Established. So if I can bring it on board here, if this is, I can say this is Adam and Eva, we read a quotation and it said it is impossible of our souls to run out of the pit, the pit in which we are having them. So we have Adam and Eve and they are where? In the pit. In the pit. And then we are having our father here. Uh, just draw lines. <laughs> lines. Uh, just draw lines. Mm. Okay. So our father stands here mm. and is promising. And there was time mm. where the Lord was to come and establish me to drop his promises. I'm going to put a cross. Okay. Mm. Let me just put a cross. However, when, when you put a cross and you put here that one what? That one is to a Pentecost. It's going to think that this is where when everything is accomplished in the entire human what? In the entire human life. But it is a point when more things are established. established. So, there was a period of time. Period of time when these promises were to be established, established. If it is me and you today, we can be here, and when the gospel comes, it's going to come in the form of the what? Of a promise. And there is a point when those promises are going to be what? Established. There is a point when the Lord is going to make a covenant with us. There is a point when it's going to come and rightly draw in our inward what? Facts. There is a point when it's going to come and rightly draw in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And there is a point when it's going to come and give us a new heart. There is a point when it's going to come and forgive our sins and put them out, never to remember them. It is this point. We want to ask ourselves a question. What is the experience of God's people within this period of time before? The Messiah come, comes. Do you have any license of sinning because the promises are to be fulfilled in the future? That's what we want to see. So when we go to Gese, he tells us this. The kingdom of grace was initiated in me immediately after the fall of what? Man. After the fall of man. The kingdom of grace. What is in the kingdom of grace? Is there a sinning in the kingdom of grace? Pardon? 
the grace of the Lord has appeared unto us, teaching us to deny ungodliness. So once the kingdom of grace has been put in what? In place. In press. The grace of God is in play mm. and blessed to hear a pass from going back into the pit of what? To the pit of sin. So he says the kingdom of grace was in it, initiated in me immediately after the fall of man when a plan was devised for the redemption of the guilt what? Of the guilt rest. So immediately when God came here and pronounced and gave Genesis what? 315. The kingdom of grace was immediately instituted. He goes ahead and says, it then existed in purpose and by the promises of what? By the promises of God. This is the statement I want. And through faith and through what? Through faith, many could become its what? Subjects. Its subjects. That statement is big. Through faith, through depending on these promises, through man resting in these promises, man was to become a subject in this what? Mm -hmm. In this kingdom. And we can see this if we go and look at all the people who existed before the coming of the Messiah. We have people like Noah. We have people like Enoch. Mr. Sarah. We have people like Abraham. If we continue this side, we have Daniel, Sadrach, Nisa, and other name. These people, through faith, through resting, Upon God's promises, as we've read them, they obtained a good report, as we can see it in Hebrews 11. These people praised God. The Bible tells us, no, what's Enoch? He praised God. And what happened? God took him. God took him. So what are we saying? Even before the promises are what? Are established before the covenant is established. What is happening through faith? Man is what? Righteous. Through faith, man is what? Justified. Through faith, man receives a new what? A new heart. Through faith, man receives an enemy for sin. Through faith. Through the word of God, through God's promises, man is cleansed from sin. I don't know whether even the sins are blotted out. That one we shall see when we go further into the study. So through resting on God's promises, these people within this period of time, they are capable of revealing the character of Christ in their lives. What does it imply when you come to our generation? We are saying in the same way the gospel comes to us in the form of what? A promise. And there is a specific day when the Lord is going to come and establish that covenant. Convent. But the time between you receive the gospel and the time when it's going to come, we don't have any space. For us to sin. Why? Because the grace of God is in what? Is in grace for us to reveal the character of Christ. The master of God is in grace to justify, justify us. And the promises of God, they are in grace to cleanse us from all sin. He says, sanctify them through my what? Through? Through thy what? Thy word is what? My word is truth, but this truth, I want to say, these are promises of what? Promises of God that are capable of cleansing, cleansing us from all sin, even before the coming of the word. The Messiah to establish those promises. So this last generation, 
has a point in time, has a point in history, when God is going to come and establish all his promises in our lives, in our life, in our lives. But before we come to that point, those promises, they are already revealed in our lives. They can be seen doing a work in our life, in our lives. So we can have the, the, the character of Christ. We are already justified. We have a new work, a new heart. We already have an enemy of what? So the same. What God comes, what God does here is just come and establish. He comes here to show us justification in verity. Is that very? Very fine. Very fine. Is just establishing this new heart. Is not just giving up this new heart here. But it's just establishing it. In fact, that if you don't have it, there is nothing to establish in place. It's just coming to establish an end. And then again. But I want you to say that at the same time, if he does not become here, I want you to pay attention here. If he does not come here, even if all that has been seen that has has been revealed in our what? In our lives is of no use. If it does not come here, the new heart, heart here is of no use. The Daniels, all their righteousness that was revealed in their what? In their lives is of no use. If this Messiah. If this message of the covenant does not come here in this state establishes what? His covenant. We can see it in this quotation. So he says the purpose and the promise of God. He says then it then existed in purpose and by the promises of God. And through faith, men could become its what? Its subject. He says, yet it was not established. It was not actually established until the death of who? Christ. Until the death of Christ. He says, even after entering upon his earthly mission, the Savior word with the stubbornness and ingratitude of men might have drawn back from the sacrifice of what? Of Calvary. He says, in a gesture man, the cup of God trembled in his what? In his heart. Hand. In his hand. He might even then have whipped the blood sweat from his what? From his bow and have and have and have left the guiltless to perish in their what? Iniquity. In their iniquity. Had he done this, there would have been no redemption for the foreign what? None. For the foreign race. So we are going to see that the proof there is a promise that is established, established here. You know, all the promises that were established, were established in Christ, but not yet in man, and in man. But if Christ, 21 AD, had stood and said no, Enough is what? Mm. I cannot bear this cup. It was possible for him to give up and go back to heaven. But what was going to happen to the human race? The entire human race, including Daniel, including Abraham, including the Elijah and the Enoch. So when we come to the mountain of transfiguration, we see one who? Moses and Elijah. So I believe, this is my reasoning. So I believe when they come to the mountain, they say, brother, brother, hold, hold it to the end. Otherwise, if we give up, what's going to happen? 
we come down we to are going to come back here hold it on to the end so brothers and sisters there is a point when god comes and establishes his covenant if he does not come and establish the covenant we are all gone and this is the point in time that we all we should look for because this is where all our hope is i want to remind you of this statement the third angel's message should be given to the world as the only hope, as the only word for, of salvation to the perishing world. My brothers and sisters, it is in the history of the third angel that God comes in place and establishes all his promises to his people. But even before the third angel, during the history of the first and the second, we are walking a journey of hope. We are walking a journey where we are depending and resting in the promises of hope. Christ. Hoping we are walking, hoping, resting, and depending upon the promises of what? God. Promises of God, but not yet established in our lives. It is in the history of the third angel that the Lord comes in his temple. It is in the history of the third angel that the Lord comes and establishes his covenant and fulfills all his promises. Sister White says, the first and the second and the third angel's messages should be presented to the world. But as you're presenting these messages, make the application of prophecies that lead us to the history of the third what? The third angel. We should let people understand the events that are taking us to the history of the third angel. Why the history of the third angel? Because this is where God establishes all his promises for that generation. Brothers and sisters, the promises for this generation, they did not begin to be fulfilled in 1844. In 1844, when Christ entered into the most holy place, he began fulfilling the promises of those people who first existed and died on planet Earth. He began with who? He began with who? With? With Abel. So these people died in faith, hoping for that day. Hoping for that what? So when it came to 1844, it was time for God to fail, fail his promises. They were not in place. They are unlucky. God is fulfilling their promises when they are what? But there are people who are blessed. He fulfills these promises when they are alive on planet Earth. And I want to believe it is this last generation. So this last generation, as we are going to see, it should prepare. And it should let the world understand that there is time for the third angel, for this last generation. And it's the only hope that we have for us to have internal life. But if we receive this internal life, we have to first walk a journey of faith. We have to first walk a journey of what? Of hope. Receive a new heart temporarily. What I want to let you know, within this period of time, the new heart you have, it is really a new heart, but it is a temporary heart. I don't know whether it sounds funny. It is a temporary heart whereby if you lose your faith, what happens to you? Uh, uh, so there is a stony heart. 
And then there's a new one. A fresh, fresh. It says fresh hair. So what I want you to say, these two cannot stand in one what? Temple. In one kingdom. One must be put to death for another to come into what? Into existence. So once we accept the Christ in the promises of what? The promises of God. What happens to the stony heart? It is a <laughs> it is called to death. But I want to let you know this is not internal death. When the Bible, the Bible talks about the first one, the first death, and it also talks about the what? The second death. What is the characteristics of the, of the first death? Yes. So the person says this is what? This is resting in the tomb out again. And with this, there is this direction. This direction, someone can come back into us. <coughs> what about the second thing? Internal death never to come back into existence. Pardon? You are? It is. You still to exist with the forever? Forever. So, what is happening during this period of time? Our stony heart is put to death, but this is past the death. By the grace of God, it is put to death, and then a, a, a fresh heart is put in place by faith. But one give our faith, once we stop resting upon God is what? God is promising. This one resides. But this one cannot reside and this one remains in place. The two cannot stand in one kingdom. So whatever we are having here is not permanent, is not yet established. Our body is walking in the journey of faith, rest for it, have this precious heart established, put in place permanently. And what's going to happen to this on a heart? Okay. It's going to be bruised permanently. That's why Paul says he dies daily. My brothers, yeah, there is dying what? Dying day. This man must die death day until we come to this what? And he received second death, never to come back into what? Never to come back into ex existence. So when we go to Hebrews 11, it talks about the champions of faith. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped before, the evidence of things not what? Not seen. He says, for by it the elders obtained a good what? A good report. He says this, now that is verse 13, after identifying all the champions of what? Of faith. He says, these all died in what? Faith. Someone is sleeping completely. Wow. He says, these all died in what? In faith, not having received the promise. But having what? Having seen them far off. And we are persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the what? On the earth. That is our experience during this period of time. 
but there is a day when this promises God is going to come and establish them. So there is a day that we must walk. So I wanted to also nail this. So when we go to Romans 2, 8, 22. Romans 8, 22. He says, for we know that the whole creation groweneth and travereth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within our, our souls, waiting for the adoption, waiting for the what? So Paul, even after the cross, is saying it's not yet what? Paul, even after the cross, he says it's not yet ado adopted. So he says, waiting for the adoption, to wait the redemption of our what? Of our body, for we are saved by what? Saved by hope. So Paul, even after the cross, is still walking a journey of what? Of hope. Is waiting when Christ is going to come and establish his what? His promises. So specifically, what was that that was established when we come to the cross and what was not yet established? Established that was to be established by another coming of Christ. So when you go to Romans 5, 8 to 10, he says, But God commended his love towards us in that while we are yet seen as Christ died for us. He says, much more than being now justified by his what? By his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we are enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his what? By the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? By his love? By his life. There is a verse that I, I think I've missed there. I think it's that one. So at the cross, we are all justified, justified in cash. He said much more than being now just, justified. This is not the future. Much more than being what? Justified by his what? I want you to look at the next statement. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we are enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his what? His son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? By his life. So justification is not salvation. That word seems to be a, a bit arrogant. But when I read it here, that's what I get. We are justified. But we are not yet what? We are not yet saved. There is time when we are going to be saved by his life. And that is the point when he's going to come and establish his what? His covenant. And when he's going to come and establish his covenant is the time when he's going to come into his what? Into his temple. As a purifier of silver. As a refining of God. There is time when he's going to come and purifies the sons of death. Live. And he purifies them using his love, his life, as we shall be seeing in the next studies we're going to what? We're going to have. So there is what we call a journey of faith. Before the day he comes, we walk a journey of hope, of hope. We live a life of faith. When we get time, we shall sit down and understand what it means to walk a journey of faith. What is faith? What does it mean to live by faith? By faith. Because during this period of time, whatever we have, we are having it because we are living a life of what? A life of faith. We are saved by hope. 
saved by faith in the promises of what? In the promises of trust. Oh, right. So may the Lord bless us. Right. We shall pick up from there in the next presentation. Let us not to pray. Mm -hmm. Our precious and our loving Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for your love, and we want to thank you so much for your blessings. We want to thank you so much for the great gift that you gave, gave to us. And that is your son, Jesus Christ. You gave us life, and this life is in your son. It's humble prayer that you grant us the blessing that we may fully comprehend and understand this love, that we may all be drawn closer and closer to you in repentance and in confession, that we may really be partakers of this life that you promised us. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's my humble prayer that you may bless us with the, the gift of your Holy Spirit to once again as we are moving to expand all the truth that you want us to understand as part of this presentation that we be in position to comprehend other coming studies. Forgive us whatever we heard as human beings and we are speaking in things we need bless. What's the sound of prayer that may bless us, that may understand, and always teach us to be humble, that may use us as instruments, present your truth as it is in Christ. Thank you so much for your people. Thank you so much for those who are still coming. In Jesus' name, we come thank you. Amen. 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 Amen.